Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We appreciate you helping to make the world a healthier place. And today we're going to do that by talking about fat and answering some questions that you probably don't know the answer to. Really good one came across the exam room news desk today that I'm really hoping to get a good answer on. And that is, can healthy fat still cause heart disease and heart attacks? And what is the difference between good fat and bad fat? Is there really such of a thing? And talking about fat, well, how does it affect fertility? And then on the other end of the uh, spectrum there, how does it affect menopause? Can it affect your chances of becoming pregnant? And then later in life, how does it affect menopause? We have a lot of questions that we're going to be getting into here today about fat. And the gentleman who has all of the answers for us is the author of Your Body Imbalance. He is Dr. Neil Barnard. So if there's a question that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, go ahead and drop it in the doctor's mailbag. You can do that by posting it in the comments or in the chat box. If you're joining us live, you can also send them to me on demand anytime on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll, WLC. So with that, we welcome Dr. Barnard to the exam room live. Sir, good to see you again. There we go. Ah, uh, now, now you're open. Uh, my friend, <laughs> fat is a, it is a really popular topic. When I was looking on Google and I always look at Google trends because I'm a bit of a nerd. I was looking at, you know, what are people searching for in terms of health? And fat is almost always at the top of the list. And we have just dozens of questions that we can get to today. But I want to start with one from Peggy. And this is one perhaps that we get more often than any other. She's wondering how much fat should we be eating every day? Well, that is a great question. It's a great one to, to start with. And here's why. Um, you'll hear all kinds of amounts. And the amount that is recommended sometimes can be skewed by commercial interests. So for example, um, if somebody is trying to promote chicken products, well, it's a little bit lower in fat than say beef, but not anywhere near as low as say beans. So the people who work for that industry push the government to say, well, lower your fat intake to a certain amount, but not too low. The, the point that I'm making is that you'll get different recommendations based on kind of where the recommendation is coming from. And there's a lot of commercial interests who are coming in. But what does the science show? Um, you do need two fats. And one is called alpha-linolenic acid. This will not be on the test. Um, the other is called linoleic acid. But the, the surprising thing is how much you need. Maybe only uh, maybe about 3% of your calories every day should come from those fats. That's it. So the idea that you need a lot of fat of any kind is really off base, or I should say not supported by scientific evidence at all. So what does that really work out if, if, if you're counting? If you are up to, in the course of a day, about 20 or 30 gra grams of fat, if you're reading labels or whatever, that's all you're going to need. You don't need more than that. Um, now, the average American eats easily 100 grams or maybe sometimes more per day. And they get it from meat and dairy products, some from eggs, and of course, a lot from the fryer where the french fries come out of that kind of thing or they're dripping it on in their salad so um the the actual amount you need about 20 or 30 grams a day would be a right uh, amount but i hope you're not counting because if you go to the produce aisle and you pick up an apple or a potato um or foods that don't really have a food label on them you don't really need they're all pretty low in fat they give you the fats you need but not that excess so you don't really need to count Let's take a follow up here from Jill. So we're talking about those healthy foods having trace amounts of fat, but she's wondering, can you survive on a diet that is completely void of fat or at least contains only the foods that have that very little trace amount? Um, the short answer is yes, um, you'll survive perfectly fine. And, and there are so many foods that we think of as being totally fat free. Um, you get some spinach, put it in your cart, get some broccoli, put it in your cart. You think there can't be any fat in these things, right? and you don't taste it, send it to a laboratory. They'll tell you about 7%, 8% of the calories in those foods are from fats and proportionately high in the good fats. So you're gonna get the fats that you want. Um, there are some foods that are higher than that. Uh, nuts, um, nut products like nut butters, avocados obviously higher as well. Um, and you really don't need to be having those foods at all. Although some people would argue that a little bit of nuts is good as a source of vitamin. 
Uh, sweets here. Uh, can you explain the difference between the fats that are found in steak and in dairy and the fats that are found in those nuts and even avocados that you were just mentioning? Uh, sure. Uh, fat to your eye looks like just one thing, but a laboratory can separate fats. So you, you take the fat out of a, a steak and some of that fat is saturated fat. And by the way, let me tell you where this word saturated comes from. It doesn't mean that your steak was saturated in it although it might have been, um, what it means is that the, if you looked at the, the fat molecule under a powerful microscope, it looks like a whole series of carbon atoms, and then the atoms are, have hydrogen atoms stuck to them. And if every single place where a hydrogen atom could stick on that molecule is taken up, that's saturated. The molecule is saturated with hydrogen. And let's say there's one spot where the hydrogen is, is taken off, one available seat on the bus, so to speak. Well, that's called mono unsaturated. Or if there's a lot of spaces where the hydrogens are gone and could, could be attached, that's called poly unsaturated. Many spots where it's out there. So anyway, for any, anybody who wants to, to know the, where the words come from, that's where, they, that's where they come from. But what really matters is the one that's saturated fat. That has effects that the others don't have. It goes into your body, it causes your body to greatly increase your cholesterol. So anything that's got saturated fat, which is dairy, number one source, meat, number two source, and increasingly we're seeing coconut and palm oil added to things. They have the saturated fat that's going to make your cholesterol go up and you want to avoid those. Oh, oh, wait, but I forgot. Sorry, I forgot the crux of your, of your question, Chuck, which is you said, compare that to avocados. With avocados, it's monos, uh, mono and saturated fat. Gotcha. So uh, Deanna's question here is, uh, how can you tell whether or not a fat is healthy? And it seems to me like the idea here is just to flip it over and look at the nutrition label, right? That's the best thing to do. Um, and it, what we, you should really zero in on is the saturated fat part. And if it's very, if, if it's anything other than about zero, really close to zero, I would not have it. Um, and where that really matters now, well, obviously, if you're following a truly healthy plant-based diet, the meat and the dairy are gone, and those are the big sources of saturated fat. But so many manufacturers are now using, as I mentioned, coconut and palm oil because they have a really long shelf life. They won't, they won't help your shelf life, but they, they last on the shelf a long time before they go rancid. Um, and they have this kind of buttery mouthfeel, but they raise cholesterol levels. And I encourage people to not eat coconut oil or palm oil at all. So when you look at a product, if it's got it in it, just I, I would suggest not buying it. Um, you can't see them, um, but uh, I will say that it, it, in addition to what you're saying, Chuck, is look at the label. The other thing you can look at is if the fat is liquid and it pours, that means it doesn't have very much saturated fat in it. But dairy fat, very thick. Coconut oil is like wax. So that's a clear sign that it's got a lot of saturated fat. Love this next question from Sam. Can healthy fats, if you eat a lot of them, still cause heart disease and a heart attack even? Yeah, I think so. And a lot of it has to do with how we define healthy. Um, unfortunately, you'll hear some people say uh, fish is healthier than, than, than beef, for example. So you go to the store and you get wild caught Chinook salmon um, and you didn't look it up online and you ate it. Um, it has almost the same saturated fat content as a steak or as roast beef. Um, it's, it's high in that and plus it's high in cholesterol. So, so those kinds of so, so-called healthy fats are not good at all. Um, but let's say we're avoiding that and we're even avoiding coconut oil and palm oil. What about say olive oil? Here are the numbers, uh, for beef fat, as I mentioned, beef fat, all fats are mixtures. Beef fat is roughly half saturated fat and the rest is different kinds of fat. So call it 50% for chicken about 30% of it is saturated fat. For um, olive oil, no matter where it's from, that number is about 14. So it does have the bad fat in it. And I would encourage people to avoid it. Now, olive oil is a funny thing. It's definitely better than butter. I mean, no question about it in every way. It doesn't have, it doesn't have the uh, animal hormones in it. It has no cholesterol at all. Um, and it, and it, it also has some natural compounds that might actually be biologically active in a good way. Maybe blood pressure lowering effects or maybe even uh, effects that can help prevent heart disease. But it's also got in it, it's unfortunately got the saturated fat that can cause heart disease. What do you do? What you do is 
skip the olive oil by the olives themselves. And the olives are higher in those healthy compounds and lower in the fat. Let's talk a little bit about olive oil here for a second. We did a show on this that was quite popular toward the end of last year, I do believe. And we were talking about all of these studies that have come out that are touting the health benefits of olive oil. And one of the, the points that you raised that I found particularly interesting was that perhaps these benefits come from the fact, as you said, you know, it's better to use olive oil as opposed to Crisco or lard or something like that. And that's why you're seeing these health benefits in these studies. Here we are, say, six months removed from that show. Would the same thing hold true? Absolutely. And and that's really the thing to remember is that, that uh, beef fat, chicken fat, pork fat. I mean, these are used in a lot of traditional cuisines, but they are really unhealthy and they're, they've been responsible for a lot of problems. So a person who switches to olive oil or plant-based fats in general is making a switch in a good direction. Even so, it's not as good as, as just avoiding those added fats altogether um, to the extent that, that, that you can get away from them. It's a little bit, it's more challenging in restaurants because the, the chefs are in love with their bottle of olive oil, as you can imagine, but getting away from them is a, is a pretty good idea. Oh, oh, by the way, there's, there's one other thing I should mention, Chuck. Yeah. Um, you know, the, this um, kind of what you're saying is that the, the um, discussion focuses on heart risk. And because the saturated fat content of olive oil is lower than butter, I mean, it's a better thing for your heart. However, you, if, the person, if a person is trying to look for a diet for weight loss, adding all that olive oil, it, even if it's healthier than butter, it's not a low calorie food the calories in extra virgin olive oil in a bottle that came straight from Tuscany. It's still nine calories per gram, exactly the same as in lard. So the quality of the fat better, the calorie content high. And if a person is trying to lose weight and you're following a Mediterranean diet with a lot of oil in it, and you're, you're getting frustrated because you're not losing weight, it's because the fats in the chicken, the fats in the fish, the fats in the dairy and the eggs, and the fats in that olive oil um, are really packed with calories, I'm sorry to say. Here's the interesting thing about fat is it is found in the foods that most of us consider to be the most fun, the ones that we crave the most. So Twitch is wondering whether or not fat is actually addictive. You know, people, I don't, I don't know if I'd say the word addictive, but I would say the word at least habituating, which is um, something a lot of us have discovered in, in my own life. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, my mother at one point when I was maybe 13, 14, she said, she announced to the family, we were not having whole milk anymore. And henceforth, we would have low fat milk or skim milk. And I mean, that's kind of as much as, as our family knew about nutrition at that time. And at first, the milk tasted, the skim milk that she bought, it tasted kind of watery. And it, it, it even didn't look right. It looked kind of bluish. Um, however, after a couple of weeks, we were all adapted to it. And then once she couldn't find skim milk or something, she brought some whole milk home and we drank that and we couldn't, we hated it because we, we thought it tasted like cream. It was almost like paint. The point is your taste buds accommodate to the fat level that they've been experiencing over the previous even three or four or five days. So when you go to a lower fat intake, at first it does seem too low. And you'll think, gee, I must be addicted to fat. And you want to go out and have more fatty foods because your taste buds are calling for it. If you stay at that low fat level, then you will discover that that's the fat preference that you establish. So there are some people who say, well, add a little bit of fat to your diet for palatability. Nonsense. What you consider palatable is what you have been eating recently. So when I was the first time I went to the Atlanta airport, um, I would go through the cafeteria line and they had a, a, a tray of spinach or other greens with big hunks of fat in it, you know, fat back. I said, what is that? Because in North Dakota, it's never served that way. And they said, oh, that's what makes it taste good. Um, and it it's really all depends on what you're used to. When you get the fat out of your diet, your taste buds accommodate, and then that makes weight loss and weight maintenance a whole lot easier. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit different angle here with fat. Take a question from Alexandra, who is wondering whether or not fat can affect menopause. It can, and we don't have all the answers here. Uh, you know that we've, uh, we did a study with menopausal symptoms and it was women who had um, hot flashes, a lot of them, and they were really suffering. And so our study was a vegan diet, no animal products. 
And it also included soybeans because the isoflavones in soybeans help knock out hot flashes. But it had a third step, and that's that we really kept the oils really low, even what you think of as healthy oils. And that seemed to make a big difference. We don't really know exactly why, but I'll, I'll tell you what we suspect, or, or at least one part of this puzzle, is that in the years prior to menopause, if a woman eats a lot of fat, her body tends to make more estrogen, the female sex hormone, estradiol and others. And it appears that the body might accommodate to that. And then when menopause arrives, um, the change in, um, in, in estradiol is much more dramatic than it would otherwise be. And that's the theory behind why getting away from fats might be helpful for menopause. But I have to say that some of that is speculation. Um, we do know that changing your fat intake does change hormone levels in the body. Um, and we could see that if people did all three of these things, vegan, low fat, and half a cup of soybeans, man, it was amazing. You could really knock out hot flashes. Uh, we saw the moderate to severe ones drop by um, about 84%. And many of the women becoming just free of those troubling hot flashes. Okay, so now we've got that covered. Let's flash back a few decades and talk about whether or not fat can affect a woman's chances of becoming pregnant. We have that question as well from Alexandra. Could eating too much fat uh, also affect your chances of becoming pregnant? Yeah, I, I really think it can. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I'm glad this question came up because so many women, so many couples are struggling with fertility and they're going through all kinds of testing and, and procedures that are invasive and Frankly, they cost a fortune in some cases. Um, but diet plays a role in, in lots of ways. And in fact, in, in your body and balance, I have a whole big set of chapters uh, on, on the various conditions that affect it. Um, however, a couple of just real obvious things. If a, if a person eats more fat, fat has a lot of calories in it, nine in every gram. So that makes it harder to lose weight. Does that matter? Hugely. Um, if a woman is even a little bit toward a not so healthy body mass index, her fertility is gonna be much, much less. Now, the other can occur too, if a woman is very, very underweight, her fertility is not gonna be so good. So there is a sweet spot, but where that fertility sweet spot is, is at a BMI body mass index of, oh, roughly 19, 20, somewhere in there. Um, and so the, the best way to get there is a diet that does not have animal products in it at all is as natural as possible and doesn't add a lot of fat. It makes it so easy to maintain. What's really a, a healthy body weight. You know, we talk about fertility, we talk about pregnancy, you know, 99% of the time and rightfully so we're talking about women. But now I'm kind of wondering if, if a gentleman is eating that standard American diet, he's struggling with his weight, he's got some pounds that he needs to lose. Um, what does that do as far as his chances of, uh, you know, procreating? Does it lessen yeah. the, lessen the, chance? Oh man, great question, Chuck. Um, yes, uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, let's say he gains weight, which is what happens to, to men and women um, over time for the most part here in America because of what we eat. As he gains weight, his body fat layer is, is expanding. That's what the added weight is. And fat cells are not just little bags of fat. Um, a, a, a fat cell is a, is a factory. It's a living metabolizing factory. So the man's testosterone, male hormone, goes into the fat cell. Uh, an enzyme called aromatase grabs a hold of it and converts it to estradiol. That's right, and it comes out. And so over time, his fertility is not so hot, and he'll he may start to, to develop a little bit of breast enhancement, so-called man boobs. Um, and he'll think, "Gee, I must have eaten tofu or something," which has nothing to do with it. Soy does not cause this at all. It's a complete myth. What caused it is his weight gain. Okay, so that's thing one, um, is as he gains weight, he will have less testosterone, more estradiol. The other thing is if he eats cheese, and there are some guys who eat cheese on a pizza, on a burger, or in a sandwich, or on their mac and cheese, cheese has estradiol in it that came out of the cow. And researchers in Rochester, New York, uh, went to a fertility clinic, took sperm samples, and noticed that the men who ate the most cheese had the worst sperm counts, sperm morphology, and sperm motility. That means the, the shape and the, and can they swim straight? Um, so what we believe is that 
even though the dairy industry says, well, the amount of estrogen that Hank is going to eat in our cheese is not very big. Fertility is a delicate thing. It is easy to knock it out. And if a couple is, is trying to enhance their fertility, both, they should both get away from animal products completely. Keep the oils low, you know, follow a healthy, a healthy plant-based diet. I mean, it doesn't guarantee fertility, but it's the, by far the best place to start. And then, you know, the daggone thing about cheese, Dr. Barnard, is it is so incredibly addictive, but it's not the only food that a lot of people think they just can't live without. Peanut butter, interestingly, is one of those foods as well. Uh, we have a question from George, posted this one at 1208, wondering what your thoughts are on natural peanut butter and if it's okay to include in the diet, what is the limitation there as far as how much we should be eating? Oh, okay, great. I, um... Peanut butter, made from peanuts, um, because it's a plant, the fat that's in it is mostly not saturated. Um, but take the peanut butter, look at the label. Don't look at the label that says it's all natural or whatever it is. Look at the back and see what they actually put in there. Um, and if it's just peanuts, then it's not really going to bring your cholesterol up. Um, but it does have a lot of calories, just like any other fat. Um, but the other thing to look at in the ingredients label, a lot of peanut butters nowadays for some unknown reason, are throwing palm oil in. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that's high in saturated fat, and, you, and you'll see that reflected in the numbers. Uh, let's take a question from Victor here, talking about a specific type of fat here, uh, omega-3s. Victor is wondering uh, whether vegan omega-3 supplements have been linked to prostate cancer. Oh, wow. What a sophisticated question. Good heavens. Um, the exam room audience is so knowledgeable. Um, yeah, well, well to, to make sure everybody else knows what we're talking about. Um, researchers have looked at omega-3s. You know, people go to the store and they would get fish oil. And they're getting fish oil because it has DHA in it and it has EPA in it. And they're thinking, this is going to help my brain. And, you know, the brain does use those fats. However, studies showed two things. First of all, they showed that people who are supplementing the omega-3s don't get a lot of the benefits they were hoping for. It doesn't really reduce the risk of heart disease and so forth really at all. But the other thing is that studies showed that men supplementing with uh, omega-3 or having higher omega-3 in their diet had more prostate cancer. And at first, the researchers thought this has just got to be a fluke because frankly, you can't come up with a biological mechanism by which that should happen. But the findings were showed up in one study after another, after another, after another, and it's 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 one of these things now where you believe it. It's, it's, I, I believe it has to be true, but we don't really know why. And so the question then is, if I take DHA or EPA from a fish, but instead of eating that, I'm going to have DHA or EPA that came from algae. Um, the, the, the benefits of it presumably would be the same, but we don't have any evidence that that DHA or EPA is free from the the risk of prostate cancer that we've seen with the animal derived omega-3. So for now, the jury is out on that question. And I would personally be surprised um, if even the botanical ones uh, didn't have that risk. I want to say hi to Ashley and Heidi, who are able to join us live for the very first time. I appreciate you both being here and everybody who's tuned in worldwide today for the exam room live. I love it. I love it. So many times we get these first time viewers and then they just make it that appointment viewing Dr. Barnard every Wednesday at noon Eastern. Uh, they join us right here because it seems to me like the mailbag is just kind of this endless bottomless pit where people want to fill it up with the questions because the amount of knowledge that's out there and the amount of knowledge that we want to get out there, it really is limitless. Do you still have the same kind of passion for nutrition and health as you did when you began your career? You know what we're discovering, Chuck? And the answer is yes. Um, what we're discovering is way back when a generation ago, we thought, well, the foods you eat might affect, you know, your calorie intake might affect your weight, might affect your cholesterol a little bit. And what has happened over time is that we are discovering an explosion of the applications that we have. Um, it's not just cholesterol um, and it's not just blood pressure and, and it's not just diabetes, but it's also how much you can change things. Um, a generation ago, we had no idea that you could reverse type two diabetes fairly reliably um, with a healthy diet change as long as you get to it early. And then as you and I have discussed, we've sent, we found applications for uh, women's health, for things like fertility, for things like menstrual pain and, and endometriosis menopausal symptoms, um, uh, skin health. And it's, it's astounding to see all the things that diet will affect. 
I, I guess maybe we should have assumed that because if you're fueling your car with diesel instead of the unleaded that it takes, it's going to make your exhaust bad and your acceleration bad and every, everything's not going to work right. If you fuel your body with the wrong stuff, things are going to go, go badly. But, but to answer your question, no, I'm, um, I'm, I'm delighted um, to see the, the expansion of the data showing how we can use diets in a healthy way, the number of conditions that are improved by it. And, and I got to tell you one other thing, Chuck, a generation ago, if you went into a health food store to buy things, the cashier was named Sunshine and they were playing, <laughs> playing folk music. And they had a few products on dusty shelves and the soy milk was a powder. You had to like mix up and you know, pour it on your cereal really quickly before it precipitated. Well, those days are gone. I mean, industry is stepping up with products that are frankly terrific. I mean, there are some things out there that you don't want, don't want either. Um, but it is amazing to see the the ways that you can have foods that are healthy and delicious, and the explosion of recipes and cookbooks and food experts is, I got to say, just a wonderful thing to see. That was such an accurate picture of the old health food stores, too, man. I mean, my brain just flashed right back to those places. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Darcy is in a pickle. So I think that let's talk generally, not just about Darcy's situation. I'll preface by saying that uh, because a lot of people probably find themselves in this same position. Darcy has lost a good amount of weight but now has hit that plateau for a number of months, just can't get that scale to budge after losing 25 pounds, eating a clean, whole food, plant-based diet. What else can somebody do to help get rid of that stubborn belly fat that just wants to hang on for dear life? Okay, great question. And you are not alone. Um, first of all, congratulations on what you've done. The weight loss you've had, that's fantastic. And to have kept that off, that's great. And so now you're thinking, well, I want to go further. Um, you didn't say this, but I but I would make sure that we, we don't go further without saying what is a healthy weight. And if people are wondering, am I where I should be? Um, if you have any doubt, just look up your BMI online, your body mass index. That's your weight adjusted for how tall you are. So go into any internet um, search engine, put in BMI calculator, and a little machine will come up that says, how tall are you? You put that in, how much do you weigh? And it'll then tell you your body mass index. If it's between 18 and a half and 25, that's the good range. So if that's where you are, that's fine. And there's no big health reason for getting lower. But I have to say some people do feel better if they're not right at 25. They want to get down to 24, 23, somewhere in there. But if you're at 20 and somebody is saying you need to lose weight, I mean, they need a new eyeglasses prescription. I got to tell you, you're already in, a, in, you're already doing fine. But let's say your BMI is elevated and you want to lose weight more. And if you have eliminated all animal products, you, if you haven't eliminated all animal products, that's step one. But let's say you have. Now do a search and destroy for fats in the diet. And the reason for that is that every gram of any kind of fat, not just animal fat, but even say peanut butter or avocados, every gram has nine calories in it. So um, peanut butter, almond butter, uh, nuts themselves, if you're having more than just tiny trace amounts, they're going to slow down your, your weight loss too. Um, and what you'll discover is if you're using those for satiety and you just kind of set them aside or have them uh, in much smaller portions, you'll discover that your weight comes down to a new set point and your tastes and desires come to hit that same set point and you start to, to like the new diet that you're having. So you've now got more grains, more fruit, more vegetables, more beans, less of the fatty nuts, guacamole, uh, salad oils, and cooking oils. In your book, Your Body in Balance, you cover endometriosis quite extensively. Jojo at 1229 is wondering what the connection is between endometriosis and fat in the diet. I'll tell you what we believe. Um, and just so that people know what we're talking about, um, the endometrium, endometrium, is a thin layer inside a woman's uterus. That's the layer where if she's pregnant, that's where the little uh, embryo attaches. So the endometrial layer is, is supposed to be this layer inside her uterus, but in this disease called endometriosis, the cells have somehow escaped and endometrial cells are now outside the uterus. They're implanting on the ovaries and the fallopian tubes and the intestinal tract, and they make you just miserable. Okay, so here's, here's where fat comes in. Um, when a woman eats more fat, her body makes more estrogen. We don't know why, but it happens. 
Tufts University researchers proved this back in the 90s, bringing women in, feeding them more fat, less fat, and you could show their estradiol levels just go mm, 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 based on the amount of fat that they're eating. Uh, same with fiber. If you increase fiber, estrogen goes down, okay? So your average American eating a lot of fat, not much fiber, has a higher estrogen level in her blood, and the problem is the estrogen fuels the endometriosis. Don't take my word for it. If you have this condition now, stick with your doctor and so forth. But for the next couple of cycles, try this experiment. No animal products at all, zero. Keep oils to a bare minimum. Don't cook with them. Use non-fat cooking techniques. Skip the, the, the guac, skip the, the nuts, skip the salad oils. And do this as an experiment for about three cycles, three to three months, and see if you don't feel better. What you've done with the diet is you've reduced the estrogen stimulation on those cells. And at least theoretically, you ought to be better. And if you are, uh, come back into the exam room and let us know. All right. We've got time for a couple of more. And I want to end with a really interesting question. Um, somebody sent in with a link to an article about something I had never heard of before. Um, so that's that's the tease. So stand by for that in just a few minutes. But first, I want to take a question from Nate. We've been talking about having fat in the diet, how much is too much, even if it's a quote unquote healthy fat. Nate specifically at 1229 is wondering what your thoughts are on a vegan high fat, low carb diet. So essentially the keto diet, just the vegan version of it. Um, I, I think it's a mistake. I understand why people go there because a ketogenic diet um, causes weight loss really for one reason. Um, carbohydrates, which are healthy foods, fruits and grains and beans, but they're about 60%, 50, 60% of what people eat. And if you take all that out of your diet, you're going to lose weight because you're just eating fewer calories. And so, but what you're left with is, is meat and unhealthy foods. And so cholesterol levels sometimes go up and you're thinking this is not going to be good for my brain or my colon. Um, and, and you're right. Um, so people have said, well, what if I do it that way, but I'll do it all vegan. So I'm going to eat fatty stuff, but I'm not going to eat any fruit and I'm not going to eat any sweet potatoes and I won't eat any whole grains anymore because those have carbs. In them. I would encourage you not to do that um, because the weight loss is as good or better with a healthy, low fat plant-based diet. And the things that are in fruits and in vegetables are the vitamins and the, and the other nutrients that you really need uh, to protect against serious illness later on down the road. So I, there are people who are experimenting with these fatty uh, vegan versions of an Atkins diet. But my suggestion is that we, we go back to kind of the old tried and true, which is beans, grains, vegetables, fruits, keep the oils really low and you're, you'll hopefully reach your weight goals. I'm talking about omega threes a little bit earlier. EE at 1230, wondering specifically about flaxseed. Uh, how much is too much when it comes to flaxseed in the diet? Um, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, you're right that flax has omega three in it. Um, it has a basic omega three that your body will elongate to other forms, and that's all good. Um, but you're also right that it's because seeds, including flax seeds, are so fatty. It's going to interfere with weight loss if it gets to be very much. But a, a rule of thumb would be something like a tablespoon or something like that. It's hard to impeach that. And now for something completely different. Final question of the day comes to us from Pete, who sent along a link to a very interesting article in the Washington Post talking about a specific insect that, if you're bit by it, could create a lifelong allergy to red meat. Pete's question, what are your thoughts, Dr. Barnard, on the tick that causes people to become allergic to red meat? Well, I have to say that any tick that encourages people to go vegetarian is, is obviously has uh, something going for them. Uh, but, but no, seriously, um, what, what you're talking about here is the Lone Star tick. Um, and it's all around here. I'm we're in Washington, D.C. right now, but if you go into the woods of Virginia or much of the south and eastern U.S. and now in the central U.S. too, you'll see these ticks. Um, and they will attach to you. And um, ticks cause all manner of problems. They, they are associated with Lyme disease, with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, with Ehrlichia, and these, these are trouble. But what we're talking about here is something different. You got the tick bite, you recovered, everything was fine. You may not have had any symptoms at all. A month later, two months later, you're out at a steakhouse. And after dinner, you develop a rash and you got hives and you're itching all over the place and you feel kind of sick um, and your stomach isn't working right. And it's like, was it something I ate? And 
I, it's almost like an, I must have eaten something that I'm really allergic to. And the answer is, yeah, you are. The tick makes you allergic to red meat. Um, and it, it'll, it'll make you allergic to any mammalian muscle tissue that you eat. And for the rest of your life, you're not going to be eating that anymore. So that's what it is. Oh, um, by the way, for people who want the details on this, it was actually discovered um, that the technical term for this, uh, this meat tick syndrome, it's called alpha gal, um, the alpha, alpha gal syndrome, uh, alpha GAL. And it was discovered by Thomas Platts Mills, who is at the University of Virginia, a wonderful researcher. And he gave a detailed talk at our International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine in 2021. And so you can see that actually at our website. And I hope people will go and you learn every last thing uh, that you need to about this. And you'll also realize you wanna be really careful when you go into the woods. Yeah, man, you really do. You learn a little bit about everything at ICNM. That's coming up this year, August 18th through the 20th here in Washington, DC. So pcrm.org slash ICNM uh, is the place to go for a full list of the 30 plus speakers we're gonna have this year at the conference. You can register, uh, save your spe uh, seat today because uh, space is limited. There are only a certain number of tickets and it's always a full house. And we're so glad to be able to do this back in person this year. I think it's gonna be a fantastic three days. It, it really will. And actually, we are, we're socially distancing still. And so we normally have about a thousand uh, people at it. We're going to have we're going to have to limit it more than that. I'm sorry to say, um, but we're still going to have a really healthy crowd. And um, we're really looking forward to it. We're having two presentations on COVID and nutrition, all the, the, the new findings that came in about how diet can affect uh, the risk of severe COVID. We have lots of other terrific presentations. I think it's going to be our best one ever. Uh, oh, and, and the other thing, I, I hope I, it's okay that I let the cat out of the bag on this. We are unveiling our universal meals program, which has meals that work for basically everybody. And we are going to have uh, kind of the equivalent of, of well, tasting session uh, stations so that you can try foods like you have never had before. It is going to be so fun. Dustin Harder, uh, who's been on, on the exam room many times, um, is going to be there uh, unveiling universal meals. It is going to be so fun. You just broke a little news. I did not yeah. know that there was going to be a tasting station. That is well worth the price of admission alone. Oh my goodness. Okay. Now yeah. I'm, I'm doubly pumped. This is going to be yeah. fantastic. It's going to be great. In fact, not just one tasting station. We're going to have all kinds of them all around and people are going to rate their favorites. And the beauty of this is these are, if you've got a friend who's say gluten-free or somebody else is keeping kosher or whatever, the whole idea is to have foods that work for everybody. But one last thing um, is that we worked with the CIA, uh, the other CIA, the Cul Cul Culinary <laughs> Institute of America to turn these food guidelines into just delectable, meal, delectable meals. And the Spork sisters um, in Hollywood worked with us as well. Um, DC Vegan did it. And all these groups have come together to give us the just amazing recipe. So uh, I, I really need to focus on the science, but the food is going to be fabulous. Yeah, you know, Dustin was on the show not too terribly long ago and uh, gave us just a little taste, went over a few of the recipes that have been uh, added to the Universal Meals yeah. program. And I mean, these are crowd pleasers. You are not sacrificing flavor when you eat one of these things. I mean, these are 10 out of 10, just exquisite, exquisite culinary masterpieces. Uh, Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much for being here today and bestowing all your wisdom as always and answering so many of the questions. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And uh, Kathy, I see your question here. Uh, no, you do not have to email your questions. We just only have enough time to get to as many as we can, um, but it's not always every single one of them. So uh, if we did not get to your question today, go ahead, keep on posting it in the comments or in the chat. We do see every single one that comes in and we do our very best to get everybody an answer uh, on every single show. Um, so go ahead, keep posting it. You can also send them to me anytime again on social media at Chuck Carroll WLC. And the final question today, we had a few people wondering where can they find a good plant-based doctor in their area? Well, the good news is the Barnard Medical Center offers telemedicine visits in a large portion of the country. So if you're looking for a good plant-based doctor or dietitian, that is a great place to start. So you can log on to barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500 for full list of states where services are available or even schedule your appointment today. So barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500. And lastly, today cannot wrap up the show without also giving a huge thank you to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their 
their continued support of the Exam Room Live and the Physicians Committee. You know, the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like ours that carry on Greg's love for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. Just phenomenal group. You can visit them online right now, the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund at GregoryRyderFund.org. That's Gregory Ryder, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R, fund.org. And for today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. Again, thank you, Dr. Barnard, for being here and helping to raise our health IQs. And to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen, thank you guys, as always. And to you, exam roomies, thank you for sending in so many wonderful questions and making the exam room live the special, special thing that it is. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>